Professor Tribe, I've been eager to get your reaction to what we know at this point of Clarence Thomas's involvement in this case. Well, as you said, Lawrence, what we know is that his wife had a direct interest, not simply as a cheerleader, but as a participant in the strategy uh, to overturn the results of an election to prevent the transition of power, something that Judge Carter just a couple of days ago said was a serious crime on the part of the president, or at least probably was. The only possible answer that I suppose Justice Thomas might give is, I had no idea what my wife was up to. Of course, we don't always assume that people know what their spouses are doing, but the law that you quoted contains a provision saying that a justice is obliged to inquire of his spouse if there is doubt whether his spouse has an interest in the proceeding. And here the interest was not exactly secret. It's been widely known that Virginia Thomas is actively engaged in the groups that were trying to overturn the election. She was involved in the text messages that Clarence Thomas would have hidden from the public if his solo dissent had been the view. Those text messages show that she was involved in the strategy itself, telling them that they should get Sidney Powell to overturn the election, that they should put pressure on Vice President Pence. She and Mark Meadows, who worked closely together all the way back to the days of the Tea Party, were basically in cahoots. He was the chief of staff, not just a bystander. And she was working with the chief of staff. And the communications that Clarence Thomas would have kept secret were ones that he should have had no voice in keeping from the American public. Because this law, contrary to what a lot of people say, is not optional. I've heard supposed experts say that it applies only to lower court judges, but Supreme Court justices are exempt. No, they're not. It specifically says that no justice shall participate in a matter where he has reason to know that his spouse or her spouse has an interest, and the interest here was very direct. Now, it's true there's no clear enforcement mechanism, but that doesn't change the fact that what Clarence Thomas did was illegal. And if he continues to participate in matters that arise from the attempts to get information to the January 6th committee or anything related to the 2020 election, he is going to be violating the law again. And I would assume, because this hurts the whole Supreme Court, not just him, it's not just a blot on his reputation, that the other justices are going to whisper in the Chief Justice's ear, um, Mr. Chief Justice, you better do something about this. And there are things he can do. He can make it clear to Clarence Thomas that if he does not, from now on, recuse in all of the matters that arise out of the attempted coup of the insurrection, that he will be assigned the most boring of all opinions. Chief justices have sometimes done that for petty reasons. This wouldn't be a petty reason. He is not likely, when the chief is in the majority and has the power to decide who will write for the court, not likely to give Clarence Thomas any plum assignments until and unless Justice Thomas begins complying with the law. Now, there are going to be calls for his impeachment as a practical matter. That's not going to go anywhere. But the Constitution is clear that justices hold their seats only during good behavior. And violating an act of Congress, 28 U.S. Code Section 455, is not exactly good behavior. The threat of impeachment is a hollow one now, but it underscores the seriousness of what Justice Thomas has done, and as you say, it's not something that our history 
indicates other justices have done. There have been scandals, but nothing like this. Yeah, and in not that long ago in Washington, there would have been bipartisan, instantaneous bipartisan calls in the House and the Senate uh, for some action here, whether it be action by the chief uh, of some sort and absolute demands uh, that uh, Clarence Thomas recuse himself. And impeachment would not have been out of the question in the past for, for this. Uh, but now we have a Senate where we know we could never get to the uh, two-thirds vote necessary. And so in the meantime, uh, it's just a question of uh, asking the country to just trust Clarence Thomas's judgment? Is that all we have? Well, that's not all we have. Congress can hold hearings on making an enforcement mechanism available and the very plausibility of those hearings. And there are statutes that have been proposed. The president's commission on Supreme Court reform, on which I served, suggested that Congress might make various disqualification practices mandatory and put some teeth behind the mandate, uh, the very fact that those things are going to be discussed by people even from one side of the aisle should put the fear of God, if you'll pardon the expression, into the justices who are ready to flout the law.